Qualifications? Okay, keep going. Hold on to your butts. Nasarius killed my entire family and took me with him. They gave me the name Arthelaeus. Began my training and education in the histories of the mother world. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. One more thing. Eugene, give me that. If I ever find one of these lying around again, I swear to God, I will stop being so polite. Get the f*** out of my sight before I demolish you. Boy, is he strict. Execute Order 66. Gotta get in there close and find out what's happening. Hey guys, how you doing? It's your boy Dragon here, and yeah, I finally watched the uh, Rebel Moon movie, and let me just say that my takes on this might be a little spicy, but please bear in mind that I decided to do this after watching the entire movie from beginning to end, and that the opinions expressed here are explicitly my own. So, without further ado, let's talk about the core bits of this movie that make it into the Taco Bell version of all your favorite sci-fi movies and shows, alright? with you what's wrong with y'all you niggas are crazy listen up brother let me tell you something i ain't never do drugs come on now dog i feel like i'm taking crazy pills so the story begins in the most force awakens way possible by having an anthony hopkins voiceover tell us that the imperium of man I mean the uh, human mother world empire's rulers, kept their power on challenge for a thousand rulers, but their lust for power caused them to drain the resources of their planet so fast that they sent out their warships into the vast reaches of space, and let's just say that they conquered a lot of worlds while creating a massive intergalactic human empire until the current king and queen in the movie's timeline were assassinated in what seems to be a military coup like that of Julius Caesar. Huh? Oh, we're going there, are we? In the aftermath of the Horus Heresy, I mean the military coup, a bunch of worlds on the outer rim of the Empire's borders decided to rebel because of how tyrannical this Empire is, and as usual, a crazy, battle-hungry military senator cyborg named Belisarius Call. wait, crap, hold on, I mixed the names up. Uh, what does that say? Balisarius decided to do a show of strength to the Senate by sending one of his most brutal commanders, Atticus Noble, in order to crush the filthy rebels. <sighs> I feel like I've heard this story before. Now, the story starts in earnest when we get introduced to our main character, Korra, and let's just say that she is basically the female version of Finn from The Force Awakens, but with a little more cookie-cutter backstory added in order to let us know that she isn't a Mary Sue because of her decorated military background and connection to being a guard of the royal family's princess that had the power resurrection like the Native American mother of Maya from Echo, which I won't get into because the movie is saving all that info about that can of worms plot for the second movie, obviously. What are stories but mystery boxes? There's a... What a load of shit. 90% of the time, I have no idea what the fuck I'm talking about. <clears throat> well, folks, he's got a point. Now, she survived a shipwreck and ended up becoming attached to a community of farmers that were celebrating a good harvest until the Imperium forces commanded by Noble arrived the next day, and let's just say that they're very polite in letting people know that they don't take no for an answer. <laughs> Excuse me, sir, but you just skipped a lot of levels, okay? <laughs> you one crazy ass bitch! After everyone processed the brutal death of the village elder, we get some scenes where we're shown what a bunch of dicks Imperial soldiers are, how they mistreat peaceful robots while mistreating the populace, and just as when you think it couldn't get any worse, the soldiers literally attempt to grape a local village girl just as Korra is about to dip the village, which leads to a big action scene that, while I can say is well shot because Zack Snyder's a good visual director, I do have to mention a small pet peeve, which is that I find it hard to believe that this woman can keep fighting the same way after taking that many punches to her body from a bunch of buff, grown-ass military men. Okay. That's fair. 
Anyway, she kills all the soldiers while saving the girl, but now the village is in trouble and Korra decides with Gunner, the Luke Skywalker village merchant of this movie, to go to a seedy cantina in some shithole on their planet in order to find information of where they can find the legendary former Imperial General Titus. Of course, what ends up happening instead is that Korra is forced to kill a bunch of goons because some greedy Warhammer 40k mutant couldn't control the throbbing willy lust in his pants for Gunner, and after those idiots are taken care of by her, they finally meet a necro Mancer Mind Flayer that tells them right on cue where they can find General Titus. Oh, how convenient! However, they end up encountering the hurdle of needing a ship until Han Lando Solo Calrissian, I mean Kai, conveniently comes to their aid to offer them his ship in order to support the rebel cause. However, Korra realizes she can't advance further into the game's main storyline quest because she doesn't have enough party members, so she's got to do some side quests for 32 minutes. What? Now, Korra ends up finding her first party member, Tarek, in the middle of a desert quarry trying to pay off some debt until she convinces his handler to free the man on a wager that he'll be able to domesticate some unruly griffin, and as we already expect, this dude uses his lineage as a way to convince the griffin to conspire with him to let him fly around for a bit in order to free him so that when he leaves, the griffin can exact his vengeance on the abusive handler, and all I can say is that it worked out pretty well for both parties. Oh, he's dead. Ah, go. Hey, Lion! Frontier justice is... it's very thirst-quenching. Before continuing, I must mention that the movie at the end tells us that this guy is apparently a fugitive of royal blood, and the only reason I'm giving you this info early is because it is very irrelevant to the end result of this movie. Moving on. Moving on, our band of rebel misfits find the second party member, Nemesis, but before they can reel her into the rebellion, they have to watch her have an altercation with some giant spider lady for a couple of minutes because they both have a slight disagreement on their philosophies regarding protective child custody. Bro, Zack Snyder is mad obsessed with the slow-mo effects in this movie. He's acting like this is the newest shit on the block cause he can't stop showing us those effects every damn five minutes. Oh, she did. But wait! There's more! Just stop! Just stop! No. Paper That's cap! Totally cap! That means lie! One eternity later. <sighs> Boy, that escalated quickly. I mean, that really got out of hand fast. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that the movie also tells us at the end that she is this big deal assassin who killed like 16 top tier Imperial senators and their security details after her family was murdered by these people for some reason because the movie never feels like answering such an obvious question the audience may have. Again, I am telling you this information ahead of time because it will not change the end result of this movie. <laughs> You serious? This is ridiculous. You're just making stuff up. <laughs> I wish. What? <laughs> okay, fine, fine. I'm cool. I'm fine. Anyway, they gather their newest party member, and finally, Korra can continue the main story mission by visiting General Titus at the Coliseum, and holy shit, Jamon Honsu is jacked! How many pounds of unfried, unseasoned Whole Foods chickens did this man have to consume on a daily basis in order to get in this insane shape? Bro is built like he was training to be on a Shaka Zulu film until he found out his agent got him cast for this movie instead. This motherfucker don't miss. That motherfucker don't miss, man. He's good. Returning to the plot, Korra convinces a depressed General Titus to get back on his feet with a Tony Robbins speech because the man felt bad that all of his men died after defying the new Imperium, and after gathering her last party member, the gang's ready to finally meet the Blood Axe rebel leaders in order to discuss with them on how they can turn their little skirmishes with the Imperium into an actual Star Wars rebellion. 
Oh, no, they didn't. Oh, yes, they did. Oh, no, they did. Shut up. Bitch, please. He can't keep getting away with it. He can't keep getting away with it. He won't. <clears throat> well, folks, he's got a point. After convincing the brother of one of the Blood Axe leaders and his men to go along with them on the same dark Naboo-like planet, Korra's party are ready to start their plan in earnest, but what's this? Kai needs them to make a quick pit stop on a dark, seedy, cloudy planet before they can properly begin? Wait a minute, did he just lead them into a trap so he could easily capture them and sell them off to the main bad guy of the movie? What? No, who would have seen this coming from 2,000 yards away? Sounds familiar. No, you can, you're not serious. You've chosen a site that doesn't even make it to the history books. What happened to Honor? Piece of shit. Oh no, they didn't. Oh yes, they did. Oh no, they did. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, shout the season, man. Shout the season, man. Well, yeah, of course the dummies got lured into a trap by Kai the Outlaw, who apparently was an informant for Atticus Noble the entire time, and he tries to convince Gunner to kill his fellow rebels with this weird prison railgun, but somehow the guy realizes he's going to die no matter what decision he makes, so he decides to free Korra with the railgun anyway and kill Kai with it, which begins this long battle sequence where a lot of Imperials and Blood Axes, including their second leader, die in the confrontation, and finally Korra gets to have her fight with Atticus. Wait a minute! That's cap! <laughs> I, I accuse you of capping! <laughs> Not a great plan. <laughs> One hour later. It's done. Yes, Mr. Frodo. It's over now. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> After that whole debacle is done with, the rebellion truly begins for Korra and her party. The AI robot from the beginning of the movie turns into a robot Boudica to signify that the robots have finally awakened to war, I guess, to rebel against the Imperium. And lastly, Atticus gets resurrected by the Adeptus Mechanicus after getting an earful from the bloodthirsty Balisarius in the spear realm of how big of a failure he is for letting Korra escape with her rebel friends, which finally ends the plot of this movie. So let's now transition to talk about the other important facets. Because the more you know. So I heard on these internet streets that people think that this movie is Zack Snyder's bad attempt at trying to make the Star Wars movie Disney never gave him the chance to do, but I have to disagree on the sentiment somewhat after having watched the film. You see, there are definitely some visual and narrative aspects of this movie that you can directly attribute to it being inspired by Star Wars, like the space cantina scene, Kai's character, the pseudo lightsaber plasma blades, the fact that Korra is a fusion of Finn and Rey's character attributes from the Star Wars sequel trilogy and even the concept of a bunch of frustrated people banding together to rebel against a powerful tyrannical galactic empire. The evidence is fairly damning. However, I have to note that half of the things I just mentioned right now can also be attributed to being direct ripoffs of Warhammer 40k as well, since you can see Zack Snyder took some very dangerous creative liberties when he designed the costumes and ships for the Imperial soldiers and some of the characters in this show. Like, bro. This is literally Chinese Nike shoe levels of ripoff that we're seeing here. Also, the fact the Imperial soldiers have such a fanatical piety towards the royal family's Imperium on the mother world that they obey the Senate's will without question after the royal family was assassinated by someone close to them that disagreed with their ruling policies, and the fact that they have such a wanton desire for death and destruction of all things non-Imperial reminds me of another more popular franchise for some reason. Listen up, brother, let me tell you something. Abandon reason! No, only war! Die! Vulcan! Even gods may die! Die, heretics! You don't die! Green skin! Let them in flame! Burn in holy fire! I scum! No prisoners! For the Emperor! Ha <laughs> ha!
As for the casting, let me just put it this way. The only actor anyone will definitely recognize off the bat will be Jamon Honsu because of how many great and mediocre movies this man has been in throughout his entire acting career. But most people will remember him from the Russell Crowe Gladiator movie. As for the Korra actress, you guys may remember her by chance like I did because she is the one that played the evil mummy in the 2017 Tom Cruise flop movie from Universal called The Mummy. She did do some other films before and after this movie and The Mummy, but they were of no consequence, so to speak. The last actor you may recognize is Kai's actor, and he is mostly remembered for playing the main characters in the first Pacific Rim movie and that Guy Ritchie movie called King Arthur Legend of the Sword, as far as I'm aware. Who? I, I, I don't care. Don't worry about it. Now, why am I saying this? Well, it's because the rest of the casting for this movie is a bunch of unknown or not as well known people that unfortunately could not show their talents properly because of the poorly written script. While there were some moments of genuine emotion delivered throughout the movie via the acting, most of the time those moments felt forced and unnatural while the remainder of the normal speaking dialogue felt like the actors were recorded reading their lines during the first take rather than the third take because of how boringly dull the lines sounded at times. It's hard to get your audience invested in your generic sci-fi story if the actors playing these characters are not directed well or invested in the characters you have given to them via the script. There is a reason why the saying reinventing the wheel exists. You don't always have to be the next trailblazer director in Hollywood when you make a movie, but you can still add some unique new flavor to the already familiar dish we all know and love. That's all I'm saying. Fair point, yeah. It also doesn't help that Zack Snyder's weakest point in this movie is writing a good script, mostly by himself in this case. When it comes to the movie's written format, my opinion is that he should have given the helm to someone else completely rather than just having Yes Men approve to his every single creative whim without resistance. Yeah, I said it. <laughs> As for the visuals, overall I can say that this film is very pretty to look at. As I stated earlier, Zack Snyder is an excellent visual director and he can easily transport people through his excellent visual filmmaking and the soundtrack combined as we've seen in previous films like Man of Steel. However, I do need to point out that visuals are only one of the many important facets that make a film great. If the other points of the film are weaker than the visuals, then all you have to give your audience is a very pretty pile of sh like rings of power you know i'm right <laughs> all right here's the part all of you want to hear from me and that is is this movie even worth watching well yeah it is a 5.5 out of 10 popcorn flick that i would recommend anyone to watch if they're already drunk and need to watch something as they fall asleep into their hangover or if you just want to watch something with your buds in order to pass the time without having to pay much attention as to what's going on in the background until the pizza delivery man arrives just in time so you can tune in for the upcoming wwe smackdown match that sounds about right. <laughs> now that I've given my two cents on this movie, I want to ask you guys to do one of two things for me. Either do what you're seeing on screen right now in order to keep up with any new reviews coming to the channel while receiving 10 years of good luck, or stick around to watch this bonus bit if you want to watch more videos right now. It's fun and good for your health. With that, friends, I wish you all a wonderful day and namarie. And now for something completely different. What are stories but mystery boxes? There's a... What a load of shit. Wanna play a game? Okay. Have a night with you. Say hello to my little friend! Damn! Damn! Oh no, I ain't messing with you. Oh no. Until next time, I'm a British person. Good night. What? You want more? It's okay. We know. <laughs>